Welcome back to the platform Nigeria. We are live at the Covenant Place, Igomu, Lagos, Nigeria. Our next speaker is Dr. Olise Agbakoba. <laughs> Dr. Agbakoba is the Senior Advocate of Nigeria and a Development Law Specialist. He studied at the University of Nigeria in Suka and the London School of Economics and Political Science and the University of London. Before founding Olisa Agbakoba Legal in 1983, he was a research fellow at the Institute of International Affairs and guest lecturer at the Military and Command School, Jaji. Dr. Agbakoba is the senior counsel of the Human Rights Law Service and is currently a member of the Presidential Task Force on Petroleum Revenue Management. No, no longer. <laughs> Please join me as we welcome to the platform Dr. Olise Agbakoba. I need a mic. I'll start by thanking uh, Pastor Oju for the invitation and to also underline the fact that. Never have I been to such an interesting event. I mean, the sheer breadth of speakers preceding me blows my mind. But I'm going to depart from what they said and be short, reflective, and serious. When I was the president of the Nigerian Bar Association, I met with the Prime Minister of Norway. He told me something that stuck in my mind. He talked about the principle of missing fundamentals. He talked about how Norway is very homogeneous, culturally, linguistically and how that had created a pathway for development. Now, I listened to the 7 a.m. broadcast of President Buhari trying to give us hope. <laughs> I don't blame him. My wife asked me, did he did he, did, did he make sense? My wife asked me, my wife asked me whether our president made sense. I said, what? Well, yeah. <laughs> the speech was inspiring, but uneventful. Because we hear that every year, really. We hear it every year. And so I do not say this to disparage the president's speech, but to point to the challenges that he faces in grappling with recession. As you know, a recession means two successive contractions in the economy. There are four economic cycles in the year. So when you contract twice, you go into a recession. I think recession in Nigeria has been masked by high oil prices. So now that the oil prices dropped, the shit hit the fan. We could see it clearly that, as Professor said, we're extremely poor. We're an extremely poor country. But it's the missing fundamentals that I want to discuss. And my thesis is that the Irunsi Gowan legacy is still with us. What do I mean? You recall the coup of 1966. Two important decrees were passed. Two. But before that, we had the Federal Constitution of 1963. And that Federal Constitution 
allocated power to the regions. It gave them their own area of competence. Power was also allocated to the federal. So the regional governments could do what they wanted to do in their own sphere without interference. Very important. The federal government also took only 50% revenues from the regions. So the region was free politically and free economically. With the passage of decree number 34 and decree number one, suspension and modification decree of 1966, our true federalism died. Nigeria ceased to be a federal state on the 24th of May, 1966. Although we refer to ourselves as a federal republic, we are nothing like that. We are simply a unitary government run from Abuja to the exclusion of the 36 states, the 774 local governments, and the FCT. The current constitution is interesting. I don't know how many of you have read it. How many? Raise your hands. You see, that's very poor. Please get a copy of the constitution because I need to have informed people. You see, the discussion here has been knowledge. Now, if you read the constitution, it will shock you to find that there is something called the exclusive list. Remember I mentioned that in 63, the regions had their own exclusive list and the federal government could not interfere in that field. Under the Irunsi Gowon military legacy, which continues because our current constitution was given to us by General Abdul Salam, which is why Chief Rotimi Williams says that the constitution that says we the people tells a lie about itself on page one. It, it tells, it's, it's, it's false to say we the people. And if you listen to the, all the speakers, there's a certain commonality in what they said, which is we have an uncaring government disconnected from the people, not interested. They bribe us with brown envelopes and 20 naira in, in the bread to vote for them. At least we should thank them that they even allow us to vote. <laughs> yeah, we should thank them. Because it's possible to say, if they didn't want us to vote, what can you do? This is the most docile country I've ever seen. With what has happened in the country, millions of us should be on the streets. But we're docile. So we have to wake up. We need to wake up. And that requires knowledge. Please make sure you don't only have a Bible, which helps, but the Constitution. Because that's the starting point of political power and empowerment. If you're not empowered, you can't contribute. We are too docile. I mean, I remember when we did the five million man march. What made me extremely angry? I was sitting, on, I was sitting drinking my whiskey on my sofa, watching Abacha, that he is going to be the, oh yeah, you know he had already taken four parties. The last was the GNPP. I almost beat my head on the wall. How can a man, one, it's a world record, be presidential candidate of five political parties? <laughs> then came this silly band called uh, Dan Kanu with his ya. Youths endlessly ask for a bacha. I said, no, can't happen. So they planned their own two million man match. We planned our own five million man match. And the reason we did this was to say to Abacha, 
you are not correct there are some unsilent voices there are some people prepared to speak i almost lost my eye at the other well less than 200 but it created the first crack in my view of the terror known as abacha subsequently he died